Good morning. Time for book club. My eyes are like not open yet. <laughs> um, we are going to start with a prayer, but it's my turn. I try not to yawn. Ooh. Okay, here we go. Dear Heavenly Father, we are very thankful for this beautiful new day. We're thankful for this week that we get to spend with our families and that we get to finish up our work today and tomorrow and then enjoy a few days off for Christmas and to celebrate my son and our families. And we're thankful for for the amazing gift that God has given us in my son. And we pray that we can not take it for granted, that we can always remember what he did for us and that we can utilize it every single day. And we are thankful for this opportunity to grow um, with this business and with this book club. And we pray that we can take what we're learning to heart and apply it. We can love those around us and be able to listen to them and, and bring them positivity. And we love you so much. And we say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Ooh, I'm gonna start that. Okay. Start the time. Well, I'm gonna say where we are first, and then I'll start the timer. So we're on my book. We're on fifty-seven. Where are you? Where are we on your book, Jessica? Seventy. Seventy. Holy cow! A lot bigger pages of this. Um. So we're on each of these letters. Yeah. Where are we at? Where? Oh, that's wrong. 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 Yeah. It's open to like a different. Okay, sorry. Sixty-eight for me. That makes no sense. I was like, what? We're like two pages before the end of the chapter. Yeah. Okay, good. Here we go. Top of the page for me. All right. There is nothing either good or bad, said Shakespeare, but thinking makes it so. Mm. Abe Lincoln once remarked that most folks are about as happy as they make up their minds to be. He was right. I saw a vivid illustration of that truth as I was walking up the stairs of the Long Island Railroad Station in New York. Directly in front of me, 30 or 40 crippled boys on canes and crutches were struggling up the stairs. One boy had to be carried up. I was astonished at their laughter and gaiety. I spoke about it to one of the men in charge of the boys. Oh, yes, he said. When a boy realizes that he is going to be a cripple for life, he is shocked at first, but after he gets over the shock, he usually resigns himself to his fate and then becomes as happy as normal boys. I felt like taking my hat, my hat off to those boys. They taught me to, they taught me a lesson I hope I shall never forget. Working all by oneself in a closed off room in an office not only is lonely, but it denies one the opportunity of making friends with other employees in the company. Senora Maria Gonzalez of Guadalajara, Mexico had such a job. <coughs> Excuse me. She envied the shared comradeship of other people in the company as she heard their chatter and laughter. As she passed them in the hall during the first weeks of her employment, she shyly looked the other way. After a few weeks, she said to herself, Maria, you can't expect those women to come to you. You have to go out and meet them. The next time she walked to the water cooler, she put on her brightest smile and said, Hi, how are you today? To each of the people she met. The effect was immediate. Smiles and hellos were returned. The hallways seemed brighter. The job friendlier. Acquaintanceships developed and some ripened into friendships. Her job and her life became more pleasant and interesting. Peruse this bit of sage advice from the essayist and publisher Albert Hubbard. But remember, perusing it won't do you any good unless you apply it. This totally happened to me in um, a ward. I was in a ward in New, um, Las Vegas. It was my first time away from my home ward. And I didn't make any friends. Like, I wasn't very friendly. I was just like, no, he likes me, you know. And I was like, I hate it here. And then we moved to Missouri later. And I was, like, determined. I was like, I'm not like, I'm just going to go out and make friends. I'm going to. And then when I moved here, I did the same thing. And, like, instant friends. Like, it's like. I love this word, but it's all for me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Whenever you go out of doors, draw the chin in, carry the crown of the head high, and fill the lungs to the utmost. Drink in the sunshine. Greet your friends with a smile and put soul into every hand clasp. Do not fear being misunderstood and do not waste a minute thinking about your enemies. Try to fix firmly in your mind what you would like to do. And then, without veering off direction, you will move straight to the goal. Keep your mind on the great and splendid things you would like to do. And then, as the days go gliding away, you will find yourself unconsciously seizing upon the opportunities that are required for the fulfillment of your desire. Just as the coral insect takes from the running tide the element it needs, picture in your mind the able, earnest, useful person you desire to be, and the thought you hold is hourly transforming you into the particular individual. Thought is supreme. Preserve a right mental attitude, the attitude of courage, frankness, and good cheer. To think rightly is to create. All things come through desire, and every sincere prayer is answered. We become like that on which our hearts are fixed. Carry your chin in and the crown of your head high. We are gods in the chrysalis. The ancient Chinese were a wise lot, wise in the ways of the world, and they had a proverb that you and I ought to cut out and paste inside our house. It goes like this. A man without a smiling face must not open a shop. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> the Chinese proverbs are always so blunt, and it's just like, I love it. <laughs> your smile is a messenger of your goodwill. Your smile brightens the lives of all who see it. To someone who has seen a dozen people frown, scowl, or turn their faces away, your smile is like the sun breaking through the clouds, especially when that someone is under pressure from his bosses, his customers, his teachers, or parents, or children. A smile can help him realize that all is not hopeless, that there is joy in the world. Some years ago, a department store in New York City, in recognition of the pressures its sales clerks were under, were under during the Christmas rush, presented the readers of its advertisements with the following homely philosophy. The value of a smile at Christmas. It costs nothing but creates much. It enriches those who receive without impoverishing those who give. It happens in a flash, and the memory of it, it sometimes lasts forever. None are so rich that they can get along without it, and none are so poor but are richer for its benefits. It creates happiness in the home, fosters goodwill in a, busi in a business, and is the countersign of friends. It is rest to the weary, daylight to the discouraged, sunshine to the sad, and nature's best antidote for trouble. <laughs> Yet it cannot be bought, baked, borrowed, or stolen for it is something that is no earthly good to anybody till it is given away. And if in the last minute rush of Christmas time, some of our salespeople should be too tired to give you a smile, may we ask you to leave one of yours? <laughs> for nobody needs a smile so much as those who have none left to give. Well, to smile. I love that last one. For nobody needs a smile so much as those who have none left to give. I kind of want to put this up on my walk on my house. <laughs> that whole smile quote. <clears throat> okay, next chapter. It says, if you don't do this, you are headed for trouble. Let's find out what it is. Back <laughs> in 1898, a tragic thing happened in Rockland County, New York. A child had died. And on this particular day, the neighbors were preparing to go to the funeral. Jim Farley went out to the barn to hitch up his horse. The ground was covered with snow. The air was cold and snappy. The horse hadn't been exercised for days, and as he was led out to the watering trough, he wheeled playfully, kicked both his heels high in the air, and killed Jim Farley. Ooh. So the little village of Stony Point had two funerals that week instead of one. Jim Farley left behind him a widow and three boys and a few hundred dollars in insurance. His oldest boy, Jim, was 10, and he went to work in a brickyard, wheeling sand and pouring it into the molds and turning the brick on edge to be dried by the sun. Young. Yeah. <laughs> his boy, Jim, never had a chance to get much education, but with his natural uh, geniality, he had a flair for making people like him, so he went into politics. And as the years went by, he developed an uncanny ability for remembering people's names. <clears throat> he never saw the inside of a high school, but before 
He was 46 years of age, four colleges had honored him with degrees, and he had become chairman of the Democratic National Committee and Postmaster General of the United States. <coughs> Jim Farley and asked him the secret of his success. He said, hard work, and I said, don't be dumb. He then asked me what I thought was the reason for his success. I replied, I understand you can call 10,000 people by their first names. No, you are wrong, he said. I can call 50,000 people by their first names. <clears throat> Make no mistake about it. That ability helped Mr. Farley put Franklin D. Roosevelt in the White House when he managed Roosevelt's campaign in 1932. During the years that Jim Farley traveled as a salesman for a gypsum concern, and during the years that he held office as town clerk in Stony Point, he built up a system for remembering names. In the beginning, it was a very simple one. Whenever he met a new acquaintance, he found out his or her complete <coughs> and some facts about his or her family, business, and political opinions. He fixed all these facts well in his mind as part of the picture, and the next time he met that person, even if it was a year later, he was able to shake hands, inquire after the family, and ask about the hollyhocks in the backyard. No wonder he developed a following. <clears throat> for months before Roosevelt's campaign for president began, Jim Farley wrote hundreds of letters a day to people all over the western and northwestern states. Then he hopped onto a train and in 19 days covered 20 states and 12,000 miles traveling by buggy, train, automobile, and boat. He would drop into town, meet his people at lunch or breakfast, tea or dinner, and give them a heart-to-heart -heart talk. Then he'd dash off again on another leg of his journey. As soon as he arrived back east, he wrote to one person in each town he had visited, asking for a list of all the guests to whom he had talked. The final list contained thousands and thousands of names, yet each person on that list was paid the subtle flattery, flattery of getting a personal letter from James Farley. These letters began, Dear Bill or Dear Jane, and they were always signed Jim. <laughs> Jim Farley discovered early in life that the average person is more interested in his or her own name than in all the other names on earth put together. Remember that name and call it easily, and you have paid a subtle and very effective compliment. But forget it or misspell it, and you have placed yourself at a sharp disadvantage. I'm going to finish this paragraph. Uh, for example, I once organized a public speaking course in Paris and sent form letters to all the American residents in the city. French typists with apparently little knowledge of English filled in the names, and naturally they made blunders. One man, the manager of a large American bank in Paris, wrote me a scathing rebuke because his name had been misspelled. You want to see? I'm, I really, it really bothers me when people misspell. Names. I am in trouble. <laughs> I, really, I got, I hate it when I misspell names. I'm like, oh. I got to figure this out. Cause like, <laughs> I can remember people's faces, like nobody's business, but their names. No, like, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard one. It's a hard one. Gotta it's easier. Hard. When it's in print, you know, like, so all these messages that I have going back and forth with people, it's, like, easy for me to remember their names. The problem is, is I don't have faces to go with them. Yeah, that's true. You know, and so it's just like, oh, man. But, and you know, as we were reading the chapter, I was like, well, I'm, I, oh, well, I guess I'm not going to be very successful, you know? And then I thought, Jess, you know what? It may take you a long, long time. You can figure out how to start remembering people's names. You can, you can get a system. You can figure something out that works for you. You can start remembering people's names. Yeah. I always thought that, that Heavenly Father was going to give me a calling, like, you know, as really society president or something. <laughs> You know, so that I would get good at remembering people's names. But apparently this is the way he's going to do this gift for me. Well, you might just get called a really study president after you, you've worked a bit. Get good at remembering people's names, right? <laughs> yeah. I got called to it right before I started Plexus. And it was just all, you know, all came together. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I think if you just take a little bit of extra time, like what I try to do is, because when someone tells me their name, I instantly forget it. And so I'm like, I ask them like three times, I'm like, tell me your name again. Okay, tell me your name again. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and then I'm like, okay, I'm 
just say it in my mind like five times. <laughs> and even then, sometimes I forget it, but I try to like consciously. Yeah. Well, it's like, and it's interesting, you know, that I think what it seemed to me that he was doing was creating some sort of mental image, right? Mm-hmm. Like, while he's looking at the person, he's thinking of their name, he's taking the information and almost making like a little mental collage of pictures. Yeah. Something. I don't know if I could do that, but I got to figure something out. Yeah. You know. have a book of names. Something <laughs> out. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to be definitely like prayerful about this today because... Mm-hmm. Yeah, I gotta figure something out. <laughs> <laughs> A new problem to solve. <laughs> Love All it. right. It's a good one. Bro. Oh, the head scratcher. <laughs> yeah. The chin rubber. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be awesome. <clears throat> All right, y'all. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>